thanks all for coming. Um, it seems like we have a, a smaller uh, group today, which is, I think, good. And um, I felt, you know, increasingly that the the space has become more conversational. Um, and, you know, I think maybe today we don't really need to do breakout groups. We can kind of be a, a breakout group. And hopefully, I think that will still people will um, speak. Because uh, especially if we're, yeah, only, you know, less than 20 breakout groups might um, not make sense. So I prepared, you know, I, I prepared some remarks, I think, just to kind of start us off, but I, but I don't have a ton. Um, and there's a couple directions we can go. Um, my, you know, <clears throat> my, uh, my interest here is, is comparative. Um, and I want to try to develop something of a comparative understanding of the Workers' Council and maybe what we could call its kind of classical moment, right? There, are, there, are, there is a kind of later moment for the Workers' Council, maybe the, the post-classical Workers' Council. Um, but, and so, you know, there's a, big, there's a big difference right off the bat, uh, which is that, you know, in Italy, unlike in Germany and Russia, councils formed, but the state did not collapse. Um, and this has a lot to do with the position of Italy in World War I uh, and just the different um, political and, and sort of economic status of, uh, of, of Italy. Um, there was you know, resistance to the war uh, um, by the rank and file, but you know, soldiers councils didn't form. They were on the winning side. Um, you know, and I think in, in, in every regard, it was a somewhat less developed revolutionary situation uh, in which the meaning of council or factory committee um, varied. And of course, it was limited to the, to the north. And, you know, Italy, it's also the kind of post reunification status of Italy is still a fairly internally divided um, country. So, you know, the, the councils there could in no way become instruments for the direct construction uh, of communism. And, and it's true in, in Germany that in many, they were far from that too, but at least at the very beginning, that was a possibility. Um, and, and so, you know, the fact that the empire collapsed in, in Germany made for something very different. Uh, Marxism was, of course, less developed in Italy. Nothing like German social democracy existed. And anarcho-syndicalism, um, you know, was the kind of pr predominant uh, variety of organizing among the proletariat, especially in the North. Um, the fact that there were syndicalist and anarcho-syndicalist unions meant that self-organization did not work against the unions, but through them. And that's just a key difference, right? There isn't this kind of anti-union attitude that you get uh, with the German communist left. The unions were in this sense like the factory groups of the ultra left agitating and organizing for revolution, but they were also unions negotiating with employers in the state. Um, like Luxembourg, syndicalists emphasized struggle as movement, as the building of working class power, act by act, strike by strike, which would in some cases, you know, which could in some cases lead to a lack of clarity about the tasks of revolution or even a refusal to discuss them much. And I think you can see this within the IWW, which, you know, um, didn't really often kind of put forward an idea of what a revolution would look like or, you know, say much about the construction of a kind of post-capitalist world much. Um, and I think this explains the fact that syndicalism in Italy managed to influence Gramsci, whose politics are probably somewhere between Luxembourg's and Lenin's. Just as Luxembourg did not see in the 1905 Workers' Council's revolutionary instruments, but instruments of the mass strike, I mean, revolutionary instruments in the sense of instruments able to create communism directly, um, Gramsci's group saw the factory movement and the factory committees as the building of a pre-revolutionary mass party that could gradually improve its position both in and beyond the state. Um, this had the effect of confusing revolutionary uh, with pre-revolutionary tasks. And I think just for to create some kind of comparison here and to, and to draw out the differences, you know, recall the words and thinking of Jan Appel uh, and the position of the KPD. You know, for Jan Appel, there was the old workers movement and the new workers movement. There were the unions and the councils, the tasks of reform and the tasks of revolution. And the choice was very clear. 
And you know, the German situation created this kind of polarization and this opposition that didn't really exist in Italy. Um, the goal of the council arts in, in you know, Germany was clear. In Italy, however, such clarity would have to be um, hard won. And just as with the CNT in Spain, syndicalism's tendency toward opportunism was hard to grasp you know, before the fact because it often resulted directly from principle. You know, hence Bordiga's critique, which I think we should try to take in parts. Um, and I'm wondering if, since we, you know, since so many people here are, you know, know as much about this as, as I do, I wonder if anybody would just like to summarize the Bordiga position for us. That I don't, I mean, it's, I can do it, but, um, but I think that it, you know, might be somebody else would like to, 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 to sort of say how they understand Bordiga's criticism. Um, of the the factory council movement, the the, the Gramsci group, um, and you know perhaps by extension, uh, syndicalism and anarcho syndicalism. I mean, we got Anya here. Come on, I mean, you know somebody's gonna somebody will do it. We've got we've I got. Th I, gotta... I thought I thought you were you were gesturing at me. I actually, oh, I actually wasn't, but then I saw that you were here, and I'm like, "Come on, I'm not doing it. You're doing it. If 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 no one else will." Okay. Um. God, I'll be perfectly honest. I it. I took such a long break from reading, uh, Bordiga that this was actually bringing me newly back to Bordiga. But nice. let me um, let me go get my book real fast, which I should have had anyway. <laughs> Where is it? More lasagna, less spaghetti. No. I'll find it in a second. Basically, my uh, broad understanding of Bordiga's uh, criticism is that um, the situation in the factories. Um, because it is, I mean, as I see it, sort of limited in, in, the, in the way that uh, unions are limited, although he would never put up with a confusion of, of unions and factory councils. It's in a, an economic negotiation position. Um, so um, the way I always read this is, is it's sort of um, when you limit yourself to the workplace, um, A, you tend, you tend to have the problem of, um, of um, sectionalism and, um, you know, workplace particularism, and you tend to have uh, sometimes the problem of, um, trade or industry particularism. And um, you have the problem of the confusion between uh, tasks of the whole class and um, tasks of uh, whoever happens to be working in the factory. There's a lack of coordination. And for uh, Bordiga, that coordination is solved by the party nucleus because the party nucleus is where he locates the uh, most advanced uh, proletarians. Um, for him, the sign that you are like an actively communist proletarian is that you're, um, you know, a revolutionary communist party cadre. Uh, so that the party um, even becomes the nucleus of the Soviets. And it's in the Soviets, in the area councils, in the regional councils, um, that uh, he locates the political tasks, really, uh, the tasks of the uh, running of society um, in the immediate terms. And he wants the party 
uh, cadres to be the ones who even establish the area council. So it grows out of the party. Uh, and of course, he's always railing against spontaneism, which is some, one of the things that I always had the most trouble with, um, even at my most boardagist. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is that question of like when I was reading the, uh, the anarchist writing that you gave us on the, um, the two red years, yeah. um, they just mention in passing that one of the basic failings of the two red years was a lack of coordination. And, and, and then they go on to say, well, you know, the, the most radical Marxists, the Gramsci group, it's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but, well, actually but, the writer, the I don't know if they're, um, some of those, the, that writer has been semi-involved. I don't know if it's come to the group, but, but the person who wrote that, and they, they apologized for what they felt was like an inadequate appreciation of the abstentionists, you know, through dialogue with me, they, they, they want to revise that, that part and that they, oh, thought, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, grouse yeah. at anyone. Um, I've been coming to an increased appreciation recently of, um, I don't know what a, what a, um, how much uh, difficulty can be involved in doing communist writing yeah. as a grown ass person in capitalism. But, yeah. um, you know, uh, yeah, that, that's what I think the appeal of um, Bordagism in so far as one endorses that term um, that's the what the appeal of the Italian communist left formation was for a lot of us uh, was the appeal to the coordination of the interests of the whole class. And I would also point out that um, when I first read this stuff, what really stood out to me is the emphasis on the area councils means uh, and means a mechanism for bringing in disabled and unemployed workers and proletarians who are not in the workplace, <laughs> which, you know, for all of the excitement of, you know, the workers directly taking the levers of production into their own hands and all of that, uh, that gets pretty spoiled when you start thinking about um, housewives, disabled people, um, you know, I mean, even children, teenagers, if they're not being incorporated into some kind of trial or teenage labor, um, you know, the, the whole proletariat, right? Right, right. So that was great. I mean, that's. I think you, you, you know, you really, you really got it. One thing I would add is that 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 is, I think, the essence of it. There's another part to it, which I think is the kind of simpler version, which is maybe, and also the one that's easier to kind of accept, um, which is that you know it's premature. The forming of the councils is premature because they haven't smashed the state. And in addition, if you are going to form the councils, you should do it in this particular way. And you shouldn't base it in the factory committees because they will only represent sectional interests. And you should do it in this way where the party comes in and essentially nominates its own people to be the delegates of the regional councils. And then, you know, and then, of course, for Gordica, yeah, the party just becomes the whole of society. Um, you know, in a way right. that it like, doesn't even seem to act, doesn't seem to adequately take into account, like, how do you get the buy in of people? And, and so what I would say is just as a challenge to the boarding of position here, and which I think is, you know, really well stated, and there's a lot to it. And obviously, it's at the heart of communization's kind of critical assessment of the history of council communism. Um, one thing I would just say is that it's because it's because the councils were these councils, these pre-revolutionary councils in which there were syndicalist unions, both orienting towards, you know, winning 
particular improvements and potentially a, a revolutionary kind of assault on power, I think that made it easier for Bordiga to think of them as necessarily um, sectional and, and sectoral. And I don't think that's necessarily the case, right? In, this, in the situation in which the unions, which do represent the sectional interests of class, have been essentially um, proven to be corrupt, like in Germany, right? The factory groups aren't really representing sectional interests, they're representing revolution. Um, and so, you know, I think that 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 and, and and the anarchists, you know, even so I think because they're not they're not doing, you know, they're not doing negotiation and um, right. they leave that to the unions. But right. I think that, you know, I, I think that um, so that's just what I would say is that in a way it's because of the Gramsci groups kind of uh, appropriation of, of syndicalism and because of the kind of more, more reformist elements of syndicalism that like you know, we're doing this thing, that Bordiga is able to be so kind of, uh, you know, total in his dismissal. And, and he carries this throughout his right. entire understanding of, you know, whenever anybody mentions workers' councils, for him, it's always these. And it's always this kind of Gramscian syndicalist um, uh, thing that is going to fail because it doesn't distinguish the tasks of the organization of the class from revolutionary tasks. And what's interesting right. is actually when the discourse of the Workers' Council returns in the 70s, it does kind of return with this reassessment of the Gramscian um, legacy. And in the kind of Il Manifesto group, you do actually get a kind of Gramscian councilism. And so Bordiga is in a way right. You know, in the Italian context, that's probably always what you're going to get. And Bordiga is right, you know, but in but in other contexts, maybe it 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 uh, means something else. So that's like the challenge that I would offer to the Bordiga position, which, you know, and then of course, yeah. obviously, you know, regional councils, okay, that makes sense, especially as you say, you know, this, this, if you're, if your goal is a kind of unitary construction of kind of reconstructing the whole um, society and not just, you know, using what you already have, then it has to be, the locus has to be regional, it has to allow the participation of people who don't work. Um, but at the same time, you need engagement with the productive sites and the people who know how to do that. And they they should be given you know, power over the course of things too. I think it's not like an either or. Um, right, yeah. And, and that either or- you know Where you are too. That either or tends to get reasserted continually in the left on both sides where you have uh, people periodically reasserting, well, okay, we've, you know, Quote, we've lost class on the left in the present moment and we need to recover it and we recover it by you know going back to the site of production um or and then you get people who i think functionally cast a suspicious eye from the opposite side where if you're a worker well then you're not really underground really lumping you're not coming mm -hmm. from the true place which is the place of the you know unemployed or of the you know woman who is figured as not a worker which is an interesting you know agreement between <laughs> between uh people who want to not think about gender in the workplace and who want to think about gender all the time and figure it as not existing in the workplace. Um, but like the question that came up for me reading this stuff, now that I buy in less, less to the radicalization of the Leninist principle and actually do think that the, um, the totalization of the party uh, can go down some pretty ghoulish lines. Um, can go down some pretty ghoulish lines. Um, how do you have that coordination? Essentially, you know, but how do you have the coordination that's necessary without it being essentially an intelligentsia bureaucracy, a, uh, you know, self-appointed vanguard bureaucracy? Uh, which then separates itself, which then isn't coordination, but rather turns into class repression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the question. <laughs> um, that is the question. Um, 
Yeah, I was just, I was curious like where the the party comes from for Bordiga because when I was reading this, I was thinking like, well, it seems like if all of these people are involved in these factory councils and there's energy <clears throat> energy around them and they're growing or there's some there's some sort of movement around this thing taking place that 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 would be seen as some type of like organic movement of the class to like think about itself in relationship to capital and that that would be a space in which like the party in a certain sense might might originate um but it seems like in this configuration at least at the end of the soviet piece that the the party is like clearly not those people that are doing that or if it is they're they're people that could be part of the party but not thinking strategically in the right way so like who are the other people if it's not also those people or where do they come from i guess Well, I think at that moment, it's the Communist Party. Um, and it's it's whoever's kind of accepted the discipline of the Communist Party. And, you know, he's very much a formalist in a sense of the party. And mm -hmm. it's like, you kind of have to become part of the, you have to make a pact and join the thing. What the thing is at that, at what moment in Bordiga's, you know, it varies. But at that moment, it's definitely the Communist Party. And, you know, I think there were some who, within the factory movement who did join the Communist Party. And but the Communist Party actually had, especially his wing had like, you know, wasn't attempting to like actually get those people to join, which shows like, yeah, there's a, like his he he's really bad at answering that question where the communists come. It's uninteresting to him. And it's just not a real question. It's so his real he question. He sounds a lot like Lukash. He sounds a lot like Lukash when he tries to answer that question, right, where he starts doing the 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 magic finger waving that Lukash does yeah. of like well you know the party is the social brain the the nerve system of the class necessarily that nerve system like the individuals in it come from a bunch of different places uh, some of them are going to be from you know rebellious sections of the bourgeoisie and they're going to some are going to be workers and whatever but the the important thing is that they, you know, yeah, exactly, submit themselves to party discipline and, and become part of part of the nerve system so that you can uh, conceive of situations like those which did happen, which is that you have the party of the workers and the party of the workers is composed almost entirely of like intelligentsia from petty bourgeois backgrounds. <laughs> Freemasons. <laughs> Freemasons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, oh. You know, the, it's a, I, guess, I guess that's an inside baseball joke, but yeah. in the Italian context, the communist left were always railing against masonry because secret societies had been a huge uh part of the organizational structure of italian um liberal nationalism yeah and they organ they had to, they had to fuck with masons for a very long time they had to fuck with them and did um yeah um, I quick, can i ask a question mm -hmm. um so uh i think one of you just said that when bordiga talks about the party it's a really it's really like the formal party it's not the historical party but isn't that isn't that a question that people bring up i mean like you can you can read bordiga talking about the communist party as just being the the most advanced proletarians in this kind of more historical sense and and if you read it that way seems to me it could include people like Malatesta. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and and essentially like to do that is communization, right? In some way, you know, or that's the that's the that's the that is Dove, right? Dove's insight is kind of relax Bordiga's definition of the party so that it becomes this historical thing and not necessarily a formally organized one. And you can see that that's why you know Dove thinks the KPD is cool precisely because it's not this like structure made of out of discipline it's organic in this different way um and so i think that that's i think that that's absolutely right i think bordigo would probably want nothing to do with that kind of conception whatsoever and then in some ways it's sort of foreign to his 
you know, thought, which I think is, I, I really think he's interesting, but I will still call Bordiga an idealist. I think he's deeply idealist because he can't answer this question of like, he doesn't have a sense of history. It's, you know, he's he's a Platonist and he's like a Platonist communist and a very, and he's the best one. And, but he doesn't, you know, this question of like, where do communists come from, which is like, you know, it's the question we talk about in our local reading group a lot, because a lot of people there are like, um, that's like a really important question for them. And, and uh, but yeah, he doesn't care about that question at all. And Real it's boring. fascinating that Gramsci, Gram, you know, Gramsci, who's his antagonist is like, that's Gramsci's, that, that's the question Gramsci has all kinds of answers for. I don't like the answers, but that's, that's the whole point of like cultural, you know, the cultural kind of turn within Marxism and right. this idea of another kind of, you know, a, a, you know, uh, the idea that you could kind of, you know, form the proletariat, you know, form a new kind of class to these sort of interventions in the cultural sphere. Anyway, uh, he has answers. Real Borgi stands uh, deal with the pain of persistence in capitalism by writing texts um, of mystical gobbledygook where, where they talk about, you know, uh, approaching the communist horizon with the unseeing eye with your eyes closed and all that shit. No, I mean, to be fair, that that sort of writing is controversial, even within the uh, even within the Bordigist tradition. Right. But it is not coincidental that that's where it arises. You, you don't so much see people writing, uh, you know, like that in other sections of the left. No. I mean, but I mean, because Bordiga is <laughs> not a dialectician, basically, at yeah. all, um, he uses that to do something that situationally was <laughs> a pretty good move, which is to, you know, block himself and his group from becoming opportunists and swinging to the right when things fell apart. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the, you know, Gramsci has been, it seems, and I, I don't know the great details of this, but Gramsci both played into the so-called bolshevization of the Communist Party in Italy really heavily and um, has been successfully recuperated as, you know, the symbol even of Euro communism in the uh, Communist Party of Italy. So. Yeah. Or the Labor Party, right? I mean, like, <laughs> you know, it's like Gordon Brown. Um, but yeah, I agree. But at the same time, to, Lee's point, a... to, to Lee's point, you know, that like that that kind of having a spine and principle also, you know, didn't lead board the Bordigo group to like kind of get involved in the factory group and to try to kind of like, you know, they they didn't they didn't have the instincts of, you know, say an appell. Or something like that, and I mean that's, and I'll, I think just has to do with like the different context, and and but also it, yeah, just something about Bordiga's disposition, you know, just 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 kind of you know, right. And whatever. the thing is, I mean, there were it seems like there were a lot of more advanced anarchists around that were also um, maintaining, in some ways, a very similar position to Bordiga's in in terms of criticizing, um, you know, saying that, that we need to smash the state and, and, and not just, you know, not just try to run the factories for ourselves or something. And, um, Correct. Yeah. and, and they, and they were much more actively involved in trying to make it happen. And w why didn't like the Bordigas just join forces with those people? Well, they probably couldn't stand each other for like, petty reasons is what it seems to me or I just just ideological sectarian couldn't see eye to eye kind of stuff but they actually had a lot of points of agreement sectarian yes but I also think that uh the Bordiga group's valid criticism here would be what is what is the anarchist's answer to the coordination problem yeah uh Yuvia oh hi yeah I wanted to add um that I found significant to um, Bordiga's position 
in contrast with um, Gransky's, the a particular event, the the murder of Giacomo Matteotti, and the way both um, factions or um, their their approach to such event, I think, um, and and the criticism of Verdiga um, in regards to uh, anti-fascist um, efforts as as insufficient, if not revolutionary, and um, I think that's that. To my view, that's that's fundamental, and also he in that essay he mentions often the um, the need to transcend collaboration with bourgeois electoral organisms, and that that seems to be uh, something that shaped his future um, perspective on his critique of democracy and and so on yeah yeah that's a really other important point right it's the beginning of the kind of critique of anti-fascism uh which you can see you know within within this and that you know dove i think you know tries to point out that as the red thread that connects all these things german revolution uh north italy and the spanish civil war um yeah Um, he was we... right in a sense, right? He, he was right in the sense that like they, the, the, you know, the RDD defended the factory committees, but didn't like, didn't seize the initiative to actually like win the upper hand and to their great surprise, like that fascist movement, which was small and weak. And they were able to like win, you know, battle by battle, one by one, two years later was like storming the entire nation. So, you know, there, he has a point, even if, you know, I think that it's like in a way, in, in a way, I hate how this becomes like anarchist versus Marxist and, and, and it lumps all anarchists in together. And then it's like we end up kind of maligning these like incredible like people who acted with such heroism and with such integrity. Like, I don't want to do that, you know, and I don't want it to be that, you know, because it's because Marxists also like, you know, who what do they have to stand on in these, you know, in this shit? So it's like, yeah, but but I think that we. yeah. So I just, you know, I think that he has a point. Um he should have gotten down with the people who are doing the shit. Um. I I wanted to add that I mean, first, like I, whenever there's the contention between anarchists and Marxists, like uh, I just like what if you're both, right? Like what, yeah. so, <laughs> and we are so like so even like, whatever. Anyway, um, what I want to mention is um that um, but like a critique to the. I mean, after Matteotti's murder, like the tendency of these these parties that um, were um, not not exclusively communist and not revolutionary, there was this um, uh, tendency for the like inherent collaboration between between um, liberals or the the Catholic um, aligned parties and how they eventually incorporated into the the bourgeois um parliament and electoral um negotiation processes for for workers and um this is why i think he kept um emphasizing the in the three in the three subdivisions of the essay the first like for a representation that is um beyond the democratic entity and that compo composes the entire working class right like that was the first element in the system of communist representation and the uh, and that it is not only sufficient to have political representation for workers but economic and that's why um he would emphasize the the communist uh, principles I, I would say um of what the soviets intended and uh, the I think the the second one um, of like the organizational right, like the that trade unions have um, in the in the prefix of the term trade, like they already have that um, segmented, um, divisive by by artisanal or skill um, based um, negotiation processes. So there's no unity for, for the class coalition or even for a revolutionary emancipation, um, struggle. And, the 
And so he wanted to instead to advocate for the, um, I mean, yeah, like for, for labor to, for workers to, to unite in, in the general sense. And the, and the fourth one too is also like for it. So he, I think he's um, critical of, um, and I, I underline that part of um, the, the limits of the, un, the union, the trade union, and also of the labor movement. I think it was like one of the first um, somewhat like since pre prescient that he could detect what was to happen. I mean, eventually the subsumption of the labor movement. Mm -hmm. um when he mentioned just like the the requirement to be extended not just to um official wage relation um adjacent people or just people partaking in the wa wage relation but um like cl the class the for the class to take over and abolish itself mm -hmm. absolutely yeah but what's 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 interesting about Bordiga, just now I don't want to hammer on this point, is that he, you know, forever would associate councils with unions in this sense. And so even when, you know, late in life in the 50s, when he's writing his great essays, and he kind of gets wind of what Socialismo Barbary are up to as kind of a basically reviving this conception of the council, he just writes it off as like, oh, yeah, I already know all about that, you know, he, but he assumes that it's he doesn't really know the history enough. And of course, that's where, you know, some of the late Bordigas correct that with their, they try to say, oh yeah, you know, basically the KPD, they were Bordigas all along. You know, that's kind of almost their position. I think that's the position of like the Bourinet book uh, on the, on the, you know, on, on the um, left communism. And so, you know, I, yeah, I just think that, that um, it's, it's, yeah it's an important thing, but then we have to kind of, you know, recognize that he actually, yeah, it's like actually he, sh the KPD shared a lot of that. And that is pretty interesting, but they were, you know, they were councilists, councilists. Uh, and he never, you know, he never really, he never understood that, Bord Bordiga, he never got it. But, you know, Dove and Kamat and, and obviously like the generation of people that learned from Bordiga did figure it out. Sure. Matic. Well, I mean, so what, I mean, that would be moving to the Spanish Civil War. Um, and are people feel ready to do that? I mean, I, I will say, um, there's a lot of speaking of people who did heroic shit and you know, wrote important communist work under hostile conditions. I, 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 I have such a personal affectionate attachment to Paul Maddock, but, um, you know, um, both of them, right? both of them, he, 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 uh, Matic, uh, takes very much that so-called anti-anti-fascist position, and I think formulates it very well and mm -hmm. more concretely, more organically than the Bordigists often do, uh, due to their tendency for sort of Dog, dogmatic abstraction, you know, bon appetit, dogma, yum. Um, but, you know, uh, sh sh showing what that position is at, at actually about by pointing to how the um, anarchist intelligentsia uh, leadership <laughs> you, you know, uh, plays right into the defeat of, you know, helps, helps, helps the Stalinists uh, corral the revolutionary proletariat into a defeated position. Yuvia, mm -hmm. does that... Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you want to oh. talk about, let's talk about the Matic. No, I mean, I just wanted to, to add, like, um, I mean, perhaps it's a, a, a criticism of, like, the um, the term anti-fascist, but I, I was not aware of how um, just, like, prevalent as an identity it is in, in Europe until I realized that people, like, um, that, that would be like their political position in, in many places that I encounter. And uh, to me, it just sounds like um, the very minimum, but you know, whatever, like their people's trajectory and journey into politics and into the, the struggle is different. But I just think like it, um, it, yeah, I do find it insufficient. Like, of course, of course, everybody should be anti-fascist, but that's not, that's just, a, a, the, yeah, and the very minimum. So, I am sympathetic with um, with his his criticism, and and I do think that um, it if not if the again the political sphere is separated from all other, then it cannot it, it'll eventually be uh, integrated into the in and subsumed back into capitalism. All all struggles that do not take into consideration a more holistic approach. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to say that I really like this quote that Matic um, share, like, I mean, in the, in the essay that it, it was quite, um, it, I'll, I'll find it and put it in the chat. Right, great. So I have a couple of paragraphs I wrote uh, just about the Spanish Civil War that actually frame some questions for us to discuss. Uh, would that be, what do people think? I read them. Okay. Um, and again, I want to say that, you know, it's it's the criticisms that I, the, the criticisms of the F CNT and FAI of, you know, anarchists would apply really, I think, to, it's, it's the same situation that any kind of pro-insurrectionary um, you know, wing finds so the Spartacists encounter the similar problems and they also attempt to kind of solve them. So like the Spartacists in 1918, the CNT-FAI in Spain did not have a plan for success, right? I think that, that in some way is the lesson uh, or, you know, one possible takeaway um, from this is, you know, what, what what is your plan for success? Um, one of Dove's most famous insights is that the Spanish Civil War is a repeat of key moments within the German Revolution. Here's the twist. Even though the councils formed after and as the collapse of the state in Germany, the reconstitution of the bourgeois state in December meant that by 1919, the German situation was close to the Italian, with the status of the army being the key exception. Similarly, Spain in 1936, after Franco's coup, is very similar to the 1920 Cap Putsch, and the rising of the Red Army of the Ruhr, right? And this is the idea that that's the kind of, these are the key moments of the birth of kind of anti-fascism, right? Was the Red Army of the Ruhr an anti-fascist army or a communist army? Well, it was both, and it was unsure about what it wanted to be, whether it wanted to defend the Republic, you know, uh, and, and with it, the SPD that it just fucked it over, or, you know, whether it was going to make uh, communism. Uh, and Bordiga, I think, is trying to draw out a similar kind of ambivalence too that that was not in, in you know was not brought to a head in Italy, but came to a head in both uh, Germany and in in Spain. Um, you know, were the militias a defense of the republic or the beginning of communism? In Spain, it was clearly both, and communization went further there, uh, further than it has gone anywhere else, especially in the rural collectives, where the economic organization of the CNT and UGT uh, mattered much less. Communism, uh, I think we can say, was achieved in some parts of Valencia and Aragon. I mean, provisional, preliminary, but it's kind of, um, you know, what it might look like. There are two schools of thought on Spain, or there's probably more. But, you know, one is the tragic school, um, which suggests that Spain's exceptionalism, both in time and space, doomed it to failure. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of truth of this. Without an international working class offensive, even a Spain that beat back Franco would eventually have acceded to capitalism. And I think that's the kind of thrust of uh, Michael Zeidman's uh, pessimistic, you know, uh, history uh, in, in uh, workers without work. The other school is the critical school, uh, which faults the theoretical and practical failure of the syndicalists and the perfidy 
of the communists. I think in particular of Lauren Goldner's um, excellent essay on Spain. And I want to apologize that I've just been unable to uh, do the work that I wanted to do on this. And I haven't really updated the, the syllabus and added some of these things, but uh, that, that I will do that. Um, which while it offers extensive criticism, also recognizes that anarchist communism, despite its political and military impotence after 1937 or maybe even 1936, remained practically powerful and full of communist potential right up until the end in 1939. So that's Goldner's claim is that politically the movement was dead, uh, but that wasn't the movement because a lot of it was actually in the collectives. And um, so to kind of write it off uh, is to, to make a mistake. Um, and he, you know, and but he he offers a couple different kind of turning points. He also offers a criticism of the strategy from the start and suggests that, you know, uh, uh, guerrilla warfare, um, you know, could have been helpful and other kinds of things. But so, um, her say we call it the Spanish Civil War and not the Spanish Revolution, uh, and in part this is because of a choice made by leaders of the CNT not to take power not to become totalitarian uh, and to share power with Republicans. With syndicalism's gradualism also came a kind of pluralism, right? And I think that's what's at the heart here, right? The desire to win by debate uh, through an appeal to proletarian reason. And there's something really actually quite um, admirable about that. Uh, but, you know, they, they had these principles and they were somewhat pluralist principles. They didn't want to take power by force. Uh, but that, that kind of posing of the question might be the problem. So Lauren Goldner uh, offers us a counterfactual, uh, and I want to talk about this. What if the CNTFAI, instead of leaving intact the Catalan state under companies, had decided to go for broke, ir a por el todo, and replace the skeletal bourgeois state with full working class power and some approximation of immediately revocable delegates and Soviets, class-wide institutions, as the ultimate authority since worker control of industry and peasant collectives was already high, uh, widespread. Goldner highlights the absence of a plan to socialize wealth through worker directed councils, which would be able to sufficiently distinguish itself from Republican or Stalinist plans to nationalize the collectives, but also possibly provide the basis for a coherent and unitary plan for communist production and distribution capable of taking in stride collectives of all different sorts. Uh, this is more or less what uh, Grandizzo Muniz of the POUM calls for in his late articles. And it must be said that, you know, Manic doesn't seem aware that there is a kind of, you know, current that is calling for the formation of councils, um, you know, returning the revolution to its basis and worker committees, which seems at least clearer than the program of the Friends of Giroudi, which would restore power to the unions that had already you know, wasted it without any clear idea of how to organize work in society. A key question for study of the Spanish Revolution is the rapid disaffection of proletarians with the course of the revolution, as chronicled in Michael Seidman's work, but also in Borkenau, the Spanish cockpit and other sources. Could other choices have prevented this? You know, or, or was it a matter of kind of materialist factors, the lack of international solidarity, which could have either stopped the Italian panzers and German planes or lent the Spaniards French tanks and British planes. You know, do we want to fault it to the kind of the loss of the industrial, you know, from the very beginning, uh, they lost the Basque country in Asturias, you know, which is essentially the roar of Spain. That was where all your heavy industry is. Uh, and the Catalonian industry was largely, was much less developed and oriented towards um, different kinds of, of, of production. And so, you know, nonetheless, they adapted themselves to war uh, production, but in some ways they got, they, you know, uh, and that could have, that could have, you know, it could have gone differently potentially. Um, so what do we think? You know, what would have happened if they'd have gone for broke? And, and Mooney, so I want to say, um, is really interesting. And so he talks about the insufficient atomization of the revolution, right? That it hadn't been power hadn't been made sufficiently granular, uh, made basically calling for councils. And, you know, and, and the problem was is that this union structure didn't, didn't allow for the right kind of granularity to be able to allow self-organization to really kind of uh, fight, fight back against. Um, and, and Muniz, I think, I don't really know a ton about 
um, Muniz, but uh, basically I think comes eventually arrives at a kind of left calm position and becomes a Bordigist late in life in some way. I mean, starts off from Trotskyism, but eventually through reflection on the course of this comes to adopt, um, you know, many of Bordiga's uh, positions. Yeah, so, there, she, that, 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 there, there are still uh, grouplets in Spain that uh, take the positions formulated by, by Muniz uh, and carry on polemics with the, with the you know, board, boardagist per se organizations right. and so, right. so, 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 so on. I mean, I think that this nicely, I mean, you know, I don't know the history here to be able to, you know, say, oh, well, anarchists haven't been thinking about the, the problems of international coordination. And obviously that can't be true when anarchists have continually formed uh, internationals of their own. Um, but uh, it is sort of one of the tragedies of the division of questions between different groups, different group of schools and sects that the question of the um, direct uh, power of the proletariat is assigned to like you know, ultras or left comms or whatever. And then the question of the continual rolling internationalization of the revolution is um, assigned to like Trotskyists and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it occurs to me that I've never personally seen anyone address the question of whether Spain, I mean, actually like was Spain actually isolated in that sense was that a necessary was that actually a necessary thing I've, I've seen people say that it was but does the evidence hold up I mean well it was also partly a choice by you know by Britain and France and and the U.S. Mm -hmm. right to not give them arms and to not and so it's sort of like it could have gone yeah but then you're, but then you're essentially making them part of anti-fascism, and that's you know, uh, right. that comes with its own its own perils, right? So, right, yeah, uh, yeah, internationalization right. in that context in 19, you know, 38 is a is a dicey you know procedure and gets us into questions about yeah, what attitude takes to take towards you know general fight against fascism at that time. Yeah, God, at least today we don't have the fucking USSR block to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Brian. I think a really interesting part that I've seen reading some of the histories of the Spanish Revolution has been um, this supposed like unitary nature of the CNT, the uh, so-called anarchist uh, national like workers union, right? It was <clears throat> the sort of inside baseball is less important, but it had a number of sort of non-revolutionary leaders in it, which alongside the like active movement by a number of anarchists to coordinate with both um, like regional groups in Catalonia as well as with the federal government in Madrid were definitely mistakes, right? I think the idea that they were in a position to go for broke utilizing, right? This massive militant syndicalist organization, the CNT, I don't know if that was necessarily in the cards. I mean, I think I agree that they should have gone for it, but I'm not sure that 
the organization was as unitary as a lot of us suppose when we talk about it. Right. Well, that's the Rudiger position, which I, you know, I didn't add to the thing, but some of you saw um, our comrades from the London Autonomy Group share, you know, translated this piece by Rudiger, who was, you know, I guess, the delegate of the, the IWA, the Syndicalist International from Sweden in Spain. I think I've got that right. Uh, but that's, you know, his position is that that most of the most of the CNT was, you know, only kind of like anarchist in name and in fact more kind of like liberal and Republican and, and you know, that it was a kind of a, a sort of V for vendetta anarchism uh, at heart. I don't know, you know, I don't know how true that is, but there's probably a little bit of truth to that. And, and, you know, and, but also, you know, it was what, you know, the idea that it's like revolutionaries need to be made before too is sort of hard to know, right? It's not like, it's not like that, that you would only get who you have, right? If you, if you make choices, you win other people to your side potentially. So, but I do see your point. And that's obviously, you know, that's, that's the Rudiger article and based on, you know, very personal experience, that's what, that's what that person concludes. Um, do we want to take a break potentially and like contemplate this or I don't know. We've got one thumbs up. I think one thumbs up counts. That's where we're, we're organically centralist. So basically anyone, you know, it's just like, that's it. So, okay. Uh, 10 so, minutes. Okay. So we're organic centralists. So who here is the oldest and the grumpiest? So we want to know what your decision is. I think that's that's organic probably, it's probably me. And I just asked and somebody said, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I, I yeah, five, I'm ten certainly minutes. grumpier than you, Jasper. All I'll right. fight you about that. I don't know. Okay. Okay. You know, we want to, want to, we want to zero out the Dow, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, every comrade needs to get a lizard so that we can uh, receive our instructions from the Anunnaki overlords. <laughs> That's the organic, that's the organically centralist uh, lizard brain. That, that, that's how I do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just being ventriloquized. That's why you all, that's why you always get the, the freshest dubia roaches and the, the tastiest hornworms, isn't it? Yeah. Because you're, you're the, the nerve center of the party. Yes. So what do you guys think? So I was thinking um, the, the pluralism criticism when I see more like Bolshevistically oriented people who aren't complete harebrained Stalinists um make this sort of tragic necessity uh defense of the suppression of uh the Kronstadt uprising uh what they say which I've always found repugnant but what they say is essentially an anti-pluralist criticism that the demands brought forward uh, by the Kronstadt uh, proletarians were for a multi-party system and that that would have amounted to surrendering the situation to uh, electoral liberalism. Um, now, I don't think that's an <laughs> excuse for shooting a bunch of the most, you know, militant and communistic workers in the name of defending communism. And they did not successfully, um, they did not successfully defend the movement towards communism by doing so. But, uh, 
it is an interesting question, you know, when you um, back away from the um, conception of a single unified formal communist party as the solution, uh, that does open you to a horizon of multi-party uh, sort of stuff, which could bring you to a sort of <laughs> parliamentary system or something, so some, some weird sort of negotiation system between, between parties. Mm -hmm. And so again, we come, we come back to the, you know, trying to trace the self movement of the, you know, self-realization, self-abolition of, of the class trying to kind of, you know, find the red thread in history, not just in ideas, which is sort of the or to just, I'm tempted to say, easy way out. Even, you know, well, we have the communist idea, so you know. Um. I have a question that's maybe a little unrelated, but I was trying to think about some of the connections between the, the like the the Matic reading, and then also what we were reading during the like the Red Years with Italy, which seems to be this question around like. Uh, so like a maybe like a rough separation between the economic and the political when it comes to councils, um, where should they be organized or located? And um, then there's this other like main problem or concern with any of these sort of revolutions that are in particular places, which is that they maybe feel isolated or cut off, and that there seem to be these like immediate uh, necessity to sort of spread it. If it's gonna if we're going for Toto, then you gotta like it has to be everywhere too. Um, and I wonder if there are, uh, like if people have thoughts or if other people have written on whether people feel like to the degree that we can divide the economic and political, you know, maybe that's not a very good division, but to the degree that we could do that, um, do we think there's one that's better or worse at making those international connections in the sense that like if you have these councils before the state is smashed, maybe you have a situation in which workers councils can build those connections internationally before there is like the immediate need for it or whether you know more of that comes through the types of political formations like you know the the communist international or some of those other forms um but i don't know i just thought it was sort of an interesting way to think about that split um in terms of one of the, the sort of like central problems i think to a lot of the examples that we've been working with over the past couple of months which is like something happens in one place, but it doesn't sufficiently happen elsewhere at the right time. Mm -hmm. I think I'm inclined to answer that by saying the political sphere can do that kind of internationalism, but I think that's also where a lot of this internationalism has been sort of kept from happening in the past too. I mean, you know, the sort of uh, the well-known world historic split between anarchist and communist movements sort of keeping communist movements from supporting the spanish anarchists as an example um you know. um uh, first I, I wanted to say that i i really um I was grateful that the the comrades at the uh, London Autonomy Reading Group shared that um, that that essay, the translation, the anarcho syndicalism in the Spanish Revolution, uh, to pair like in um, in oppositional directions with with the matic um, more critical um, review of the same conditions, and it, it was good to have both to compare and contrast because. I I found it from the get go, and after having um, lived in in Spain uh, I, for a while, like I had, I my first reaction to the Helmut uh, 
I don't know how to pronounce the last name. Um, Rudiger, R Rudiger, the whatever. Sorry. Uh, correct me in the comments before before I speak German. Okay. Um. Yeah. I. I what I found in, in, immediately like um uh, intriguing was that he seemed to define an an inherent um identity of the Spanish the Spanish citizen the Spanish person as if as if it was not a, a, a nation state that is first of all um is consolidated by force and by violence and it 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 is but multiple um previous kingdoms that don't even share like the same national dishes or the same cuisine or even the same language or the same um development of at least in the 1930s the same development of um industrialization or even the same traditions mm -hmm. so i to for for helmut to remark on the inherent um tendency or, or um leaning of the spanish um uh, person towards anarchism uh i i felt such um reticence to accept such principle because then that is constituting and also i think believing in in the artifice of the of the nation state of the the nationality um comes with a, a set of very predetermined um ideological political and cultural um characteristics which is not the same and it's not the same or true about uh even other mexicans i met abroad etc right like we might just like tacos and delicious mexican food in general right like we might not agree so with that i i felt like i i started to appreciate that Matic's critique was more um in relation more like materially grounded i suppose in the sense that he was trying to explore um the the labor the labor worker um corporation and production process and the relations that that had been um corrupted and again were not transcended because they were not uh contemplating that if if the factories and were to be taken by the workers and in the cooperative model or like collectivist or mutualist approach then what would be the issue afterwards right like they're still partaking in the foreign trade and in the in the market etc and um i feel like that that is like a, a a very important criticism to all these movements taking place uh con contiguously um even of course especially the soviet union right like the the fact that there the if if a population that wants to emancipate itself is not producing for the domestic needs and is still partaking in the overall um um supply chain in the market and and then it it will be subsumed again right into the into into capital into it'll be capital will find a way to to find agents in in the in the population that that is still operating under the value form yeah <clears throat> olivia i think those are uh really uh insightful comments um i've been sort of this is something that's is, that, that turns over in my head a lot um the question of like what actually internationalism is in practice and like the historical uh development of the concept of internationalism um i've been focusing my reading on the early history of um, workers movements and especially uh, political socialist movements in the uh, 19th through early 20th century and you know even the forerunners in the 18th century and earlier and um, 
what really came across to me uh, was that, you know, because internationalism, the concept of internationalism predates uh, the formation of any kind of uh, socialist movement. Um, it um, is prominent in the radical-leaning wing, the more extreme wing, I guess, of the um, Enlightenment, Enlightenment liberalism. Um, in the French Revolution, some of the uh, most extreme thinkers were uh, distinguished by their uh, continual um, promotion of um, internationalism uh, and um, many of, uh, you know, like even later enlightenment people like, you know, Kant uh, had his writings about uh, creating like a, a world governmental system in order to eliminate war. Uh, and in the 19th century, it seems like uh, the question of internationalism got instinctively um, indexed to internationalism, that is cooperation between nations or between national groups, including between national groups of communists or national groups of workers. Uh, and that is kind of what Stalinists mean by internationalism today is co cooperation between national groups, which are still very much actively maintaining themselves as separate national groups. Um, and uh, oh, p p p p that comes up in, I've been, um, I've been reading a little bit on the formation of uh, Polish socialism, uh, which is a very interesting case because, uh, you know, Poland had a huge uh, revolutionary nationalist uh, tradition, um, which was uh, nobility, um, right, led by nobility, but it was uh, very much embraced by um, small peasantry and by uh, elements of the emerging proletariat as well. That's, uh, and the uh, social democracy of the uh, kingdoms of Poland and Lithuania um, is the um, party that Rosa Luxemburg came out of, and that's where her uh, famous uh, anti-national position comes from. Um, and uh, there were two groups, the uh, social democracy of the kingdoms of Poland and Lithuania uh, and the uh, Polish Socialist Party. Uh, the SDKPIL was anti-national and the uh, the PPS was um, fiercely nationalist and had basically like Menshevik positions. And what uh, ended up happening was that in the periods of the highest worker ferment, the SDKPIL would be embraced by a section of the emerging proletariat. And that's important, right? The proletariat is very much just coming into being at this time. Um, and then uh, the rest of the time, increasingly more and more as time went on, the SDKPIL would be seen as uh, foreign agents, actually, as agents of Russian imperialism. Um, and ironically, it was um, <clears throat> Lenin and Lenin's party center in Russia that finally. Uh, successfully got the leadership of the SDKPAL after decades and decades and decades to accede to Lenin's position, <laughs> which was in favor of Polish, you know, national self-determination. <laughs> 
so it was the Russian center, you know, but it is, it's, it's, it's a, it is remarkable, you know, the pressures from all sides that keep that sense of national separateness in place. The moment you say, okay, well, I'm, you know, anti-national, totally distinctively international, then suddenly it's like, oh, well, that means that you're not for our guys, which means that you're for a different nationality, right? Anti-national actually means nationalist. And here's how, you know, and it's actually very intuitive for people to make that leap, even if it's not true. Anyway, I've gone on for a while. Lee? Um, I wanted to get back to what you were saying, Jasper, about like what would have happened if they had gone for broke. Um, I do think I, I love Lauren Goldner's uh, essay on, on this and, and his position seems very, very similar and probably is directly informed by the Friends of Giruti group, I'm imagining, because they, they have this, I mean, they have this idea of a revolutionary junta being like a kind of, kind of like a anti-state dictatorship of the proletariat, like ver addition to anarchism, which probably a lot of anarchists found disagreeable, but um, yeah, but anyway, I mean, it's hard, of course, with these like, what if things like nobody knows and it's likely they would have lost anyway, but, um, but I do hope that if we ever, get a chance in hell to like have the same opportunity, um, you know, now this, if the state is collapsing and they're, and they're offering us the keys and whatever, like, you know, I hope, I hope we give it a shot because it obviously doesn't work the other way. <laughs> I don't know if that's, I'm just getting over COVID, so that's all I have to say right now. <laughs> no, that, no, that's very appreciated. I don't know that the, um, <clears throat> there was some debate on this online and um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if the Friends of DeRudy call is the same as um, Goldner's assessment. Goldner's assessment feels close to me to what Muniz says. But the thing with the Friends of Giruti is, as far as I understand, the Revolutionary Junta would still be in control of the CNT and the UGT. And, um, and then there would be this process of like forced unionization, which would then maybe make the unions more into councils. But it didn't really, you know, in, in some sense, doesn't deal with the problem that much of the CNT and UGT had already oriented itself towards this kind of reformist project and like institute reinstituted like, you know, work quotas and just, I mean, it, it was, it, there was so much regression by that point, um, you know, that it's not clear that something more radical would be required. But I may be, I may be misinformed about this, and I think there's some, you know, and and, and there's a lot of people participating maybe that aren't here today who you know, read in Spanish and have a lot of familiarity with the, the kind of primary documents and stuff like that. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting question to me. And obviously Muniz was part, was connected to the Friends of Derudi and that, you know, they're all part of this kind of like ultra left formation that is like anarchist and Marxist, but, you know, both and neither towards the end, there's people, you know, finding affinity with each other who were still, um, yeah. And I think it was probably what, what it, what it all meant was probably being worked out and, um, yeah, you make some good points there. Um, maybe it is really different, more, more than I'm imagining. But um, but on the other hand, I mean, the Friends of Giruti group were, were definitely um, strongly allied with the Poom, I think. And uh, I don't know, it's been a long time since I read this book the, about no, the Friends were. of Giruti group, but they, yeah, they, they take, were. I think they take some very pretty similar positions about right. what should have done in 36 right th that wasn't done right. like the basic mistakes of the cnt and the fai when they had the uh, in in uh may or whatever it was of um 36 
um, and and also like about uh, about guerrilla warfare and and how Morocco should have been declared independent. A, a lot of the same, same things that Goldner says. I'm pretty sure the Friends of Dirty Group says. That's the most fascinating stuff in the kind of sci-fi scenario, right? And it gets to this kind of international question and the kind of larger fascist, anti-fascist kind of question and raises these um, issues that Anya was getting into about what kind of internationalism is an internationalism that is internationalism, you know, in between nations, uh, which would be sort of like the, you know, French socialist party like pressuring Bloom to give weapons to the Spanish, right? But that still kind of preserves... Um, those structures or you know like the brigades and things like that which seems like different or a kind of spreading of the uh, conflict across the borders into you know Basque country and southern France and giving giving Morocco back and then pissing off the French and getting in you know creating a war in North Africa and um, <clears throat> you know and cutting off cutting off Franco and then being able to maybe take Asturias and, and, you know, get the industrial heartland and get the agricultural, you know, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough to really, you know, to, to really know, but it does, you know, it's like, you went, because the thing about the Russian civil war is like they won by the skin of their teeth. Right. We, we, we see, we see that as like predetermined, but they kind of barely won that too. You know, it's like, it could have, and you know, who knows what if eking it out would have led to, right. I'm not saying it would have been, you know, necessarily is like glorious communism, but but there were possibilities, right? Um, and yeah. Um, getting right uh, back to the question of, uh, of um, the, the, the c c c c c colonial question, um, Milvan, um, speaking of, uh, people I feel very warmly towards Milvan um, in his uh, uh, in the crossfire, his memoirs of being oh, yeah. a revolutionary in uh, Vietnam, uh, you know, talks about how uh, what really distinguished the the Trotskyist group from uh, the uh, the Stalinists of uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, is that um, when uh, the common turn said, okay, it's uh, time to uh, stop the anti-colonial armed struggle uh, so you know so that we can get some, a good publicity to appeal to the national prejudices of French people so we can get Leon Blum elected in France, uh, the Trotskyists said no. And the uh, Ho Chi Minh group said yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think that that, I think that that's totally, totally to the point, right? And this is what I've always said, yeah. like internationalism for most Leninists just means, you know, strengthening nations to kind of work with each other but that can't be the this you know the end of it and um yeah um i want to get back to what you were saying about matic and and i was asked to i, I shared some things in the chat um about the matic text and the context that i was asked to vocalize so that's recorded on on YouTube, um, but you know my my interest in in this text is that um, I think the position that Maddox takes is really close to what Dove says about Spain, um, and that's interesting to me. It's interesting because you know Dove is in a way the originator of communization theory, um, chiefly through this kind of intervention that he makes into a kind of reemergent council communism. And, um, you know, he, he writes this kind of criticism of the ultra left, a concept he kind of invents, the ultra left, ultra gauche. And, um, and, he, and he, he writes it and he was attended to present it to Maddox at this conference that the, the um, ICO had called to kind of bring together different, you know, council communist groups in the wake of 68. And, um, 
But, you know, he if he chooses Matic as his antagonist, which seems like a poor choice because Matic is actually much more sophisticated than a lot of other than, you know, the, the socialisme ou barbarie type of people that Dove is thinking about. And that's why, you know, Yuvia pointed out how much I think, you know, Matic is articulating a kind of communization position. It's not that far from a Goldner saying, uh, not that far from what Muniz is saying either. And like there's a kind of, you know, there's a sort of shared uh, strategic kind of sense of these things. Um, and so, <clears throat> so I think that that's interesting. Uh, the context in which Maddox writes this, I was asked about, you know, what Maddox was doing. He was in the U.S. He was in the U.S. Maddox was, uh, is a, you know, really interesting figure. And if you read the essay that I, is on the syllabus, like I have a couple chapters, a couple paragraphs on Maddox and uh, as a figure. But, you know, Maddox was very, very young during the most extraordinary moments of the German revolution, you know, he was like a teen. And at one point, you know, he was connected with this, these, you know, the, the KPD groups, and he was, you know, part of some plan to maybe break Jan Appel out of prison uh, in 1923, after he got, you know, uh, arrested for stealing the boat. But then the charges against him were reduced to something more minor, and he wasn't looking at like a 20 year sentence. And so they decided to just let him do the sentence. And that's where he ends up writing the, the fundamentals of communist production and distribution, right? Uh, but Maddox kind of made it, it was only in the end of the, the, the revolution and, you know, uh, and then made it to, to, to the US and fled uh, rather than end up in, in prison. And, um, and, you know, in the U.S., he kind of was organizing with the remnants of the IWW and the proletarian party. Uh, he worked a lot with uh, German uh, communist groups writing in German and try to work and publish, you know, kind of get those kind of commun German communists to, to move towards his position. Uh, and then he also tried to work with kind of um, the sort of, you know, new, what would be called Trotskyists, uh, I guess, at the time, people around the partisan view, et cetera, and get them to kind of read his stuff, and they just rejected it mostly. But he was, you know, he he had he had a small circle of people that were interested in stuff in Chicago, and, and uh, you know, he worked with, with, you know, different groups. But he was also involved in this kind of international uh, correspondence with the council, communist movement, right? So he's writing this piece largely for that readership. Uh, and it's important, and it's an important intervention because the Dutch German councilists were, you know, were pretty dismissive of Spain, largely because of their anti-anti-fascism uh, and also because of their kind of anti-syndicalism. And so they just had kind of written it off. So Maddock taking this kind of position that's, that's sympathetic and, and sort of is, you know, sees it as something that actually the kind of communist movement should be, should, should care about and be concerned with is, is somewhat important. And that always, that indicates Maddock was always a kind of friend of anarchists, right? And when he came to the United States, that's who he had to work with, right? That's what they're, that's who there was, um, where the anarchists, or at least like, you know, are people in the IWW anarchists or Marxists? Well, they're kind of a little bit both. It's a weird organization. And so he worked with people like that, you know, and eventually connected with Rexroth and these kinds of anarchists. And so that's what, you know, Council Communism in the United States has to kind of find its place among anarchism. And I think that, you know, was sort of the fate of it in some sense, although there was a kind of more traditional Council Communist revival in the 60s with Root and Branch, et cetera. Um, but even that was groups, I think, very different and oriented towards the, you know, American situation. So yeah, Matic is, you know, the best, basically. <clears throat> Support um, our troops. By our troops, I mean furry eyebrowed old guys who went through crazy revolutionary situations. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. And that is um, fascinating I, just because of the breadth of his experience across time and space, you know, having that German and then, you know, it's, it's just really incredible. Um, may, I, may I say something, please? Sure. Um, um, I, yeah, I found remarkable, like, certain, I mean, of course, he's such a compelling um, writer, but always, but um, there were certain um, quotes that really stood out to me in, in the, in Matic's essay. Um, uh, first, uh, and I quote, the workers' revolution must be radical from the very outset or it will be lost. Also, 
um, capitalism in all forms has only one answer for workers opposed to exploitation, murder. I thought that was like very, very like to the point and, and unfortunately true. Um, uh, the, pro the program of collectivization partly, partly realized as a war necessity did not impair capitalist principles or capitalism as such. Um, yeah. I, I think it's like, um, again, an examination that, that is critical of even the, this, um, this tendency to, to stay halfway through the, through get, getting so close to, to this um, abolition of, of the value form and then stopping halfway and, um, and the, the integration of um, capitalist principles, as he mentioned, back into the production process. Mm -hmm. I would pose the question here, has the nature of the national division uh, culturally, uh, econ the economic division between nations, uh, you know, the national divisions in communication um, and infrastructure, has that changed? in such a way at this point that um, that the, the, the problem posed by it today would be different, would be like substantially different. Um, you know, would the national division that we face be uh, in some way or other uh, fundamentally different now than what was being faced in, you know, the 10s or 20s or 30s. Yeah, those are the questions. Um, those that that is, that is precisely the question that I kind of wanted to get to. And I had a vision that we were going to do a second discussion today, um, dealing with an attempt to kind of apply these questions to the contemporary moment. Um, there's, I think, not time to have the discussion, but I think I we could I could maybe sort of pose the questions, um, and then maybe people could kind of sit with them for us to return. And you know, when we look at the the kind of the return of council communism, we can you know have have a, maybe a breakout group or a discussion of that. Um, I would really recommend the end of the Goldner article, um, which you know tries to kind of extract from the Spanish Civil War, some sense of what these questions might look like. And I can just read you um, a little of it. And, you know, it's it, it's interesting in that it it really thinks about the difference between Spain and the society in which we um, find ourselves. Uh, so he says, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> You know, Spain in 1936 was a society in which the great majority of workers and peasants lived very close to the bone. And as in the upsurges of the 1960s and 1970s, um, democratic self-management and existing means of production was the obvious programmatic next step. That obviously remains central today. But the galloping, so obviously we're going to have, you know, self-organization, a uh, revolution that begins in self-organization and the desire for it. But the galloping decay and proliferation of socially useless and socially noxious activities, already quite in evidence in 1970, has reached a level where as many workers would be voting to abolish their own jobs as we'd be placing them under workers' control in an overall strategy with all the labor power thus freed to radically shorten the working day, right? And that's, I think, this is this is an insight that I think is, you know, I've argued this point, and I think it's fundamental to communization's perspective. <laughs> Um, this is a fundamental point which are developing revolutionary movement must communicate to broader layers of society today. Those who labor in state and corporate bureaucracies or the fire sector or as cashiers and toll takers or homeland security personnel for starters are in their ample majority wage labor proletarians like those who produce material commodities such as cars, bread, steel or houses, but also nuclear submarines or weapons of mass destruction. While it is obvious that a society after the abolition of commodity production will no longer produce the latter. The important point is that for the wage labor workforce as a whole, there is no bedrock real collection of use values separate from the forms currently imposed by capital, and all will be judged and transformed 
based on global needs wants true production for use value, centered on the reproduction of the ultimate use value, labor power, is possible. The millions of cars and trucks produced annu annually may appear empirically as use values today, but we must consider the reality relative to the existing potential of mass transportation, both within cities and between them, to determine their true use value in the totality. And you know, he talks about the, the ways in which the Spanish workers were able in Catalonia to create a kind of war industry out of nothing. Um, and so he talks about the need to kind of do an inventory of what we have. Um, and then he, I think, calls for an organization that is really basically a KAPD type organization. And this seems in some way, a kind of, I guess it's more like a, yeah, it's close to communization, but maybe more oriented towards a, a party, but not, um, but he's, I'll just read it. A revolutionary organization today, to conclude, must apply this hegel marx sense of the totality to itself. This means, first of all, a modest appreciation of its own true stature in the broader global development of the class for itself. It must recognize the primacy of the real movement and see its main goal as its own abolition as a separate grouping once its tasks are accomplished. So that's not Bordiga, right? That's the ultra left. Uh, it must attempt to create within itself the closest possible approximation of the relations of a liberated humanity within its own internal life. That is Bordiga which means the deepest possible involvement above and beyond the indispensable daily tasks of militancy with analysis of the, of the world productive forces and first of all, of the world workforce to see the maturation of the methods of struggle. It must prioritize internal education, starting with the history and theory of the revolutionary moment, movement. It must attempt to embrace everything valid in contemporary culture, science, and technology and appeal to those cultural and technical strata who see the need to link their fate to that of the communist revolution, et cetera, et cetera. So this is his, you know, his, what he what he concludes from a study of the Spanish Civil War and it's like lack of the lack of preparation uh, and the absence of a, of, of a plan. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think that we could, I, some of you have seen the kind of the prompt that I that I wrote for a kind of consideration of the place of the council and self-organization today, if we were to have a kind of a revolution uh, that I think I, like Goldner, believe that there would be forms of self-organization that we might call councils or assemblies or committees or whatever, they're gonna exist, right? Uh, but the question will be how they link up and how they spread and how they cement themselves and how they produce communism and how they don't simply reproduce capitalism. So it's like factory group, Workplace Council, Local Soviet, Neighborhood Committee, Militia, Party, Union. We have so many forms on the table today uh, already, and we've seen different ideas about how they might kind of unfold in a revolution. Uh, and But forms are limited. I think to think of them only, only as forms might mistake uh, that these, these things are also functions or clusters of function. Right? Self-organization is a matter of types of proletarians. It collects them as types, as workers, neighbors, residents, partisans. Uh, but these types are roles or functions between these sets of proletarians. Which functions and which types and how to organize them, right? Where do you, where do you, you know, who, who talks to whom? Uh, who organizes with whom and how? One answer says that this is a distraction, right? That it's all really a matter of content, of program of goal, of orientation. Uh, but where does content come from, if not the party, if not from leaders, like Bordiga says? It must come from the motivations of proletarians themselves. Uh, Spain had one of the most powerful, powerfully revolutionary contents of any country, right? I mean, and this is something that I think we didn't emphasize today, which is that the, the work that anarchists had done for 50 years and kind of building a kind of revolutionary consciousness, you know, especially within the, in the, in the countryside, you know, this is the most revolutionary kind of peasantry and proletariat in, in the world. And that's part of why things went so far, um, you know, but then it dissipated. And why? Was there something else that could have happened to allow that to, you know, to uh, to keep those motivations, right? Uh, people, when they lose a sense that communism might be possible, they change their attitude, um, you know. And so I think that, um, you know, we might wonder whether it was some matter, a matter of kind of dysfunction, of there not being the right kinds of functions between these uh, self-organizing bodies. 
relations that you know. And so whether it's the lack of a kind of delegate council structure or something else. Um, but you know, if we if this were to happen in 10 years from now, where would self-organization emerge and, and how would it stabilize and unfold and you know cement itself? I think those are the the questions um, that I want to continue to to think about in here. Any anything people want to add to that is stuff to like chew on over the next month while we read CLR James and Claude Lafort and Henri Simon. Um, I guess what comes to mind is the uh, the ultra global nature of ecological crisis as something that will, in all probability, is very likely to be immediately bound up in uh, any revolutionary situation that happens. Um, uh, since a lot of the possibilities for crisis situation in the coming years will be ecologically, uh, related, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, 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 um, uh, there was something else, but it slipped my mind. Oh, yes. And, uh, I think this is easy to poo-poo in the uh, era after um, after uh, you know the fall of internet utopianism but um, reading about the classical workers movement it's it really strikes me how difficult communication was and how different that is now um, you know, the people uh, to communicate between like the uh, Marxist exiles in Finland and the uh, revolutionary um, movements inside Russia had to uh, smuggle uh, letters by hand in hidden compartments on trains. Uh, Whereas, you know, now we can, uh, you know, I like play games online with friends of mine in the Philippines who I've known for a decade and have never met in person and likely never will, you know. So that does, there are new possibilities there at the same time as the level of atomization is just off the scale. Yeah, control over the means of communication. Uh, something that's interesting that I've noted in, in you know, is that the the um, sites of media are often like key sites of struggle. So in the Spartacist uprising, you know, the main battles are over the police station, but also the the the, the Vorwerts, uh, you know, newspaper headquarters, and they take over all the newspapers. Uh, in in the May days in Barcelona, the fighting is started at the telephone exchange, which the anarchists control, and the communists are like, "Fuck you, <laughs> we want to control the." You know, and they were they were using it to to kind of censor calls and things like that, and came over like their control over the means of communication. Uh, and I think that kind of struggle is likely to be even more kind of relevant, obviously, in the future. So that's a really good. <laughs> Would it be who has seen the the thing that I wrote the like three paragraph? Okay, not everybody has seen it. Would I could play the video that uh, that that uh, was made, uh, which just like shares the prompt and people will watch that and we can end with that. How does that sound? So I think it's, it's yeah, that on. sounds great. You okay. should be able to share your screen too. Yeah, yeah, I can share my screen now. Okay, and thanks to Yuvia and everyone at Taller Ahuehuete uh, for all their cool work that they've done creating things like this. So let me see, share screen.
Okay, so let me, so let's see, I wanna get, let's put this right here. Okay, everyone can see it, right? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, hopefully it'll, it'll do uh, sound too. So let me, if you can't hear it, let me know. It is 2020 or 2030 something. And shit is bad. It's worse. It's what you expect. But there is also a greater degree of resistance. Anti-police riots are frequent. Tenant unions, some communists, but most reformists, have covered a significant percentage of the renters in many cities, as rent is everywhere more than half the income for proletarians. Base unions have organized service sector workplaces, but wages are still stagnant in the face of new inflationary shock. The shantification of the American city is largely complete, with vast homeless encampments occupying every vacant lot and stretching for miles in the interurban periphery. A new economic shock hits. Heavily indebted municipal governments some of them, led by social democrats, are in free fall. But this time, the federal government and the coalition of capital lack the political will to stabilize them. The president, elected with a mandate to end the U.S. involvement in the civil war in Mexico, is deposed by a coup. But large parts of the U.S. armed forces refuse to follow the new military leaders. Only the Marines, parts of the Army, and the Air Force are on the side of the state. But the Navy is staying neutral. The National Guard is mobilized with various objectives. Their units are effectively autonomous. The long-awaited 100-year flood finally hits California. This is good as it's going to get in the U.S. as far as revolutionary situation goes. In the California Delta, militants on boats loot the flooded arms department and burn the police stations. Is it time to form the fucking Soviets or what? Well, some tens of thousands of people seem to think so, convincing hundreds of thousands to follow suit. Oh, wait. I think, is that not the right one? Let's see. I think, okay, wait. All right, well, I, I think maybe it got cut off. There's another um, one that goes all the way to the end. But anyways, it's great. So um, yeah, is it time to form the Soviets? What do you do? Um, I mean, and that, that question is kind of different. There's different ways you can interpret it. Um, I guess I'm interested in thoughts that work with the elements or so far. You know, is, is Bordiga's position right in some way or is the you know, KPD position uh, and, but also you could sort of imagine yourself as being located in a particular place. You're not like God able to do everything, but you could also just sort of imagine what would a successful, what, what will have been done that worked. Um, so, um, you know, if people want, if people are interested in writing responses to this, I think that would be super cool. It could be fun. Uh, but also just, you know, thinking about it, talking about it with your comrades, um, disagreeing with the premise, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, so I'll see you guys in a month to talk about, see, somebody asked about adding in the inquiry thought, which Goldner works in, and that's gonna come up in exactly that. Our next session is designed to kind of look at the introduction, the, the emergence of this theme of workers inquiry within the kind of ultra left current, which is really essentially introduced by CLR James. And so we'll, we'll, we'll look at that next week. That's um, next month, sorry. Okay. Sweet. Thanks, okay. Jasper. Uh, see you guys. Have a nice Sunday. Thanks you too. For Thank coming. you. And thanks again to Ahawe Wete for the help. Yeah, that was sweet. Okay. Bye.